you ready to have that deep dive when it comes to accessibility wall? I'm joined by some great individuals who are deep in the game when it comes to accessibility. Ladies first, Tara, tell everybody who you are. Hello, uh, my name is Tara Velker. I work at Xbox. I'm one of the accessibility program managers, but I'm also the gaming and disability community lead as part of the Gaming for Everyone program. And when I'm not being your favorite purple, purple haired PM at Xbox, I co-direct uh, the Game Accessibility Conference, GA Conf, uh, with our dear friend, Ian Hamilton, who's not feeling well. So please get better, positive vibes. Absolutely, Ian, Ian is just the, He's the bomb and, and his beautiful little daughter. He always shows me pictures of her like roaming around, dancing and having fun. So Ian, you get well, my friend. I wish we had some rum for you right here, but we're going to get that for you. And I can't forget my bro, Steve Saylor. What's up, man? Tell about who you are, what you represent. Hey, everybody. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Saylor, uh, commonly known as a blind gamer. I'm a content creator, accessibility advocate, and consultant. I've consulted with studios such as Ubisoft, EA, and most recently Naughty Dog for The Last of Us Part II. Uh, I'm also the media editor for a site called CanIPlayThat.com, which is a site dedicated specifically to accessibility in video games. Uh, and I, I, this is Lane Leonardo. He's just kind of always just sitting in the background. So there's that, and uh, don't mind him. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And I'm, I'm Paul Amade. It's Lane. I'm not as important as these two individuals right here, but accessibility consultant, been a member of the media for over 13 years. Um, my beat is tech and entertainment. So that's just me in a nutshell. But it's about these great groups of individuals here. We're going to talk about accessibility. I'm a quadriplegic, been one for 27 years, and I'm an avid gamer, and I like to have a lot of fun. So let's talk about accessibility in 2020. Now, Tara, we'll go to you because you're like in the inside of this fight with us and everything. And Tara, when you first heard about accessibility in gaming, what was kind of like your, your mindset when it was first brought to you in the first place? So it was brought to me first like years ago. So I learned about accessibility in gaming before I was actually in the gaming industry. And then it just so happened that I ended up working in the gaming industry and basically um, my mentor at the time like was just like, okay, well, now that you're inside the system, how are you gonna fix it? And I was just like, oh, oh, I'm being called out right now. Um, but you know, when I, when I first started, it was like unheard of basically. Like the only interaction you would get would basically be like if one dev had like a close personal friend or family member, um, that would be like the only way they knew of or related to it. And even then it would be like, oh yeah, I totally get what you're saying, but maybe like, would they be willing to then try to champion that in the product? Maybe not. Um, and it was, it was a rough space to be in 10 years ago. It was like very emotionally draining, lots of being told no. Uh, so it, like it's a drastic change from now. Like the, the idea of any company having a full-time person on accessibility was unheard of. You're lucky if you had a system designer who knew what the word accessibility meant. No, I get you. I get you, Tara, because I think back to when I first got injured back in 2000, sorry, sorry, back in 1993, I had a super NES. So while I'm in the hospital, I'm thinking about my game. And when I got out the hospital, I couldn't play my game. So I was like, what is going to, what's going on? Even like my friends, when I got out the hospital, they had like the, the Genesis and everything. And I'm like, how in the world am I going to play? You know, never even thought about accessibility and now transform to where we are now. It's pretty freaking cool. The time in which we live in to have that. Sir Steven, talk about your, I guess, introduction to accessibility and gaming and you being a blind gamer. When did you know this is something you wanted to do in the first place? So I had stumbled into it, uh, honestly. Uh, I stumbled into it ass backwards, essentially. I was always, like, I was blind since birth, uh, or legally blind, uh, technically, uh, since birth. And I loved video games growing up, but it was hard for me to be able to play. And I just used to think that I used to suck at video games. And I would mostly watch my brother play more than I actually would play myself. And all throughout my teens and 20s, I would casually play games at best, but I never thought about sort of, it was my 
disability that was kind of getting it like in the way of uh, of playing video games i just sort of thought that you know what i just suck at video games it's something that that i can maybe enjoy if there's a game that that i'm interested in um but then when in about 2015 i started sort of doing my youtube channel but it was more from like an entertainment sort of let's play sort of space and I did like I called it blind gamer because I thought, oh, you know what? That's kind of like my niche in the let's play, like kind of separates me from like the Markiplier's, the Dr. Lupo's, that kind of thing. And I thought like that was gonna be a kind of cool entertainment thing I could be able to do. And then I got invited to a uh, Ubisoft event. Uh, it was called the UX Summit that were they were having in Toronto, where they were partnering up with Epic Games, and they had basically a whole entire room full of developers uh, from all across the industry. And I was asked to be on a panel uh, with like talking about accessibility. And I kind of thought I was like, it was cool for me because I was like, oh, I'm the only gamer in the room or I was the only YouTuber in the room. I didn't think anything about accessibility really at all until I got there and the entire day was dedicated to sessions talking about accessibility. And it was in the middle of the panel uh, that I was, I was actually like, I was sitting beside uh, our friend Bryce Johnson uh, and, uh, at Microsoft and Alex Nianiki from Naughty Dog. And we were kind of chatting back and forth and it was in the middle of that panel that I realized I've been telling myself for years that I sucked at video games, but in reality, it was that video games sucked for me. And that's when I realized, oh, this is something I need to be focusing on. And uh, I've been focusing on accessibility uh, ever since. I love it, I love it. And, uh, and, and Tara, when we look at the feedback that you've gotten for, for, from gamers over the years being in the, in the gaming industry, and we look at where we're at today and these advancements. Did you ever think that we would see kind of the strides that we see today when it comes to accessibility and gaming? It's, so it, it has been exponential, the amount of progress we make year over year. I feel like every year it's like two years ago, if you asked me this, would you have thought that? And I would have been like, no. The two years before, if you would have asked me what I was doing at that point, I would have said no. Two years before, I'd been like, no. So definitely when I started, I like maybe in some weird fever dream might have imagined something with half of the love and care of The Last of Us 2, right? So like I, and, and maybe part of it is that I'm like a deeply negative person and a little bit of a worrywart. So may, maybe I never allowed myself to dream that big. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't have seen us going where, where we're going. Or I, I'm gonna be honest, when I started, um, working in uh, game dev accessibility, there were kind of two routes you could take. You could either go the route of being a full-time consultant, which I didn't want to do because like I said, I, I'm a little bit of a worry ward. I get stressed to the idea of contract hopping from project to project. I was just like, I don't know if I can emotionally handle that uncertainty. Or you could just be in game dev and happen to be the game dev that knew accessibility. And that was the route that I went. And I in my, I kind of always thought that was what it was going to be like. And so the fact that we have like so many companies now that are dedicated to it, who have people full time on it, like that was definitely not something that I pictured back at the start, like that. And, and I love that. And now that we have those people doing those jobs, like we can do so much more. So again, I'm sure in two years, we'll have this panel again. And you'll ask me if I thought that we would be where we were today. And I'll be like, no, not at all. <laughs> no, you know, and, and, and you know what, uh, uh, Tara, just, um, you know, props uh, to you guys uh, with GA Comp and everything, um, just bringing awareness uh, to accessibility and everything. I mean, we, we really appreciate what you've done for us as a community, and uh, we never want to take that for granted, what you guys are able to do. And um, it was interesting, a few years ago at, at E3, you know, I, I knew about accessibility with, with motor motor skills like myself being a quad with my fingers not working that was some of the things that happened with uncharted 4 and some other um different features out there but it wasn't until i met steve and brandon um, um as far as being blind gamers i was like wow they need to play games too and then when we started the project of working on the last of us part two and i started to see some of the things that were going in for blind gamers and the recent advancements that we see with with blind and also closed captioning. That, that's pretty awesome. And, and, and Steve, when you look at that advancement as we progress into this fight of accessibility in gaming, how does that make you feel that, that this is now being addressed and you guys are not being left out? 
It's honestly, it, it's funny because I like this weekend, I kind of got to sort of revisit The Last of Us 2 and just kind of looking at the accessibility options that were there. Um, I'm the same as like Tara, where essentially it's like, if you asked me this two years ago, I would not have expected to be where we are with with that game and, and it being like, I can confidently say to anyone who is blind that you'd be able to play this game. That is something I've never been able to say. Anytime anyone's asked me, so what is the most successful game or like kind of like trying to find something to be able to like kind of recommend to anybody that may not know uh, anything about accessibility outside of video games. And I would always have to say, well, there's never going to be an 100% accessible game. And and there's we're str- like, they're all good. There definitely is going to be some gaps in certain areas. But the fact that I can be able to like recommend The Last of Us and for a majority of disabled players, they're able to kind of jump in and be able to play it and not only play it, but complete it. And that's something that I, I think is is really cool in and of itself that like, yeah, sure. We like, we can all kind of jump in and play games and maybe do okay. But I mean, how often do we actually complete and finish a, an entire game? And in fact, in fact, I can recommend that to someone uh, and is is really cool and to see how much of an impact that is made. Like I said before, we're gonna be looking at, at The Last of Us as sort of like a, as a touchstone moment in accessibility where it's everything from accessibility before The Last of Us and everything accessibility after The Last of Us. And it's not negating all the work that has been done um, over the past several years in accessibility. I mean, I honestly, I think The Last of Us is, is a, a, a group achievement. Yeah, Paul, uh, you, Brandon, James, uh, Morgan, like the, the Ian, the seven of us that got to work on on the Last of Us as consultants. Yeah, that's cool that we got to kind of have that opportunity, like direct opportunity, to kind of have that feedback. But we wouldn't be there without sort of the group effort from everybody from Absolutely. across the industry. Um, all of that collective kind of uh, group aspect of the, of accessibility made that happen. So even though a lot of us didn't necessarily directly work on it. We're, th- that game is a result of all the hard work that we that uh, we've been putting in. And, and and Tara, I love I love actually watching GA conference every year yeah. now because it, in a way it's like the perfect snapshot of where we're at in the industry and how far we've come. And that's why I love like this year when we finally got to have uh, that talk from uh, from those from The Last of Us. It was like I, I just it was so cool just to kind of see that and, and just kind of realize like what like what 2020 for accessibility has 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 sort of brought us to and i don't know it's really it, it, I, I just get really excited yeah and you know what tara too i want to give you props too tara i remember seeing a talk that you did uh many years ago with, with ian and i believe uh josh Straub and uh and mark mark burlet i can't mm-hmm. call him burlet because he gets mad when i call him burlet but you know i i remember i remember that talk and and speaking about just the, the group effort that we have, uh, you know, fanboy out there think that there is Twitter beef between different companies and different developers, and, and, and they kind of breed into this, like, we all don't get along. But it, it's amazing, Tara, how, how over at Microsoft, how when The Last of Us came out, how Bryce reached out to us and other developers and like, yo, mad props. And that just really showed that we're all in this together. We're all in this fight to make things and what you guys have been able to do at Microsoft, uh, Tara, has, has been amazing. And, and, it's, and it's because of the efforts of you and Bryce and others over there. And, and if you can, Tara, talk about just how, how there's a collaborative effort, no matter who you work for, no matter what team you're on, that we're all in this fight together. Yeah, one of the, the things that I absolutely love about Microsoft and Xbox is we we obviously we're going to compete. We're a business on a lot of things, but we have like taken the stand of we will not compete on accessibility um, because it doesn't it doesn't help the industry. Um, I mean, to be frank, if if we go and develop stuff for accessibility and we have the vision of moving the industry forward to be, you know, more inclusive of you know and just a, a better, well-rounded place. Like if we make things that are only for us like that won't impact the industry, right? Like we can do things and it can be a cool thing that the Xbox does or a Microsoft game studio does, but like to really make an impact, you have to work together, right? We need the strength across the industry, especially when we collaborate with partners who maybe don't put a game on the Xbox, but also put it on 
other platforms because if we can show the need and how to fulfill the need on our platform well then maybe that partner can go to somewhere else and say like hey like look how great this is other service other engine other blah 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 like can you help me too and so that's a huge thing for us and you know that you hear it all the time a rising tide floats all boats but honestly it ends up being a a better experience literally for the customers for the gamers if we work together because it results in more things being similar or developing a, a standardized language that when something is said that, that like it means the same everywhere. Um, and so yeah, that, that collaboration is really important because if we're going to push forward, like we have to go through together. Otherwise, someone's just going to, you know, get lost on this foggy trail by themselves, right? Yeah, that is so true. And when we look at the events where we, we could all come together and, and talk and and socialize, do a happy hour together, hug each other and have fun, have been impacted this year because of COVID-19. So now things are, 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 we have to do things virtually now. Now, how has that impacted the accessibility landscape? Not being able to maybe meet up after some talks and then chop it up because that's really when things are are really uh, get, get going. You know, we have those off chats where we can talk. So how's that changed uh, during covid uh, 19. Uh, uh, Steve, you want to tackle that first, then uh, Tara will get your thought on it. Yeah, actually, for for me, it, like my entire plan for like going into 2020 uh, was supposed to be I was planning on networking with as many uh, developers and people in the accessibility community as much as possible, because like I was going to start at GDC where I was just going to get a chance to talk to everybody. Um, and then literally like, yeah, two weeks before uh, GDC was supposed to happen, everything kind of got canceled and and shut down and so my like I had to kind of re rethink how how am I going to be able to even um do anything in accessibility because a lot of the consultancy kind of like really like uh a re for me I don't know if it's if it was like this for you uh, Paul but it like it kind of dried up like it was it was hard to be able to kind of uh, find out like if we can be able to work with with any uh, studio on accessibility and I think they're even still trying to be able to to figure that out on how to be able to kind of bring in outside consultants which which is fine. Uh, and, and so I was able to kind of adapt and, and I they kind of fell into what I'd normally do best. And that's, uh, and I just make content. And so by doing that, I was able to kind of advocate for accessibility um, a little bit outside of our normal accessibility circle. Uh, the sure the viral video of my reaction kind of had a had a little bit of a, a little bit of an impact on that and, and kind of a little bit, a little bit of an impact. What are you, what are you talking about, man? It blew up, like it blew up, man. It was like viral, man. Twitter verified. You're official. Tell me about it. Hey, Tara, Tara, you know what's funny? Me and Bryce was talking about that too. I was like, Bryce, you know, Steve gets verified, and here we are still like like, like working to get verified, man. So you you hey you re you reached the pantheon, man. You're you're there, man. Uh. Done right, it. Well, thank you. <laughs> we from right. Twitter, the, the Twitter plebs below you. So. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. See, 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 Steve. You know you made it when 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 the trolls come after you. See if the trolls. Oh you, yeah. You know you haven't made it so. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know. It it's still very surreal uh, of that all happening, and I think the the. I, I, the main impact or the main th takeaway I'm, I'm taking from that is yes, all the cool accolades of getting verified and, and stuff is, is cool. Um, but what I really loved the most and, and majority of the responses that I was getting from that was the, it was opening up people's eyes, pun intended, uh, to the work that we've all been doing. And that was, that was sort of what I like, I've kind of, I, I want to make sure that that happens is that people are like, you know what, I never un understood accessibility before until, until I looked into last of us or until I saw your video, whatever. And that was like, I'm cool with like, if I can, if I can open the door for people or at least open a window and they can take in, take a look inside and see what we've all been doing, then that, then my job's done. Like it's, it's, it like, it, it's awesome. Uh, and also as well, like just being able to, like, cause we talk about accessibility a lot in, in regards to like settings and, and options and, and having all these kind of different things to allow us to be able to, to play as disabled players. But one thing I'm really proud of, at least from that uh, viral video was that it showed sort of the human factor of accessibility in that how much it can impact 
someone like it impacted me like it, and heck i worked on it and i still got emotional just seeing like the final version of of what was there and it was it was kind of one of those things of like i i i i'm still i'm still kind of like figuring everything out uh, uh and but uh, like if i could get yeah if the takeaways could be if people are introduced to accessibility for the first time outside of a kind of our own accessibility circle uh and people are seeing it uh, that there's a human impact to it and just a bunch of like list of settings and options uh, that are available then then that's then I, yeah my job uh, my job is done <laughs> I, I love it see i thought you were crying about the big cookies that we got every day what oh uh, wait cry. you got cookies <laughs> oh you didn't get cookies oh i'm sorry my, my bad i ain't getting cookies <laughs> tara see tara you're on, you're on a different side of it and and we really want to want to delve into this not only putting together conferences but also working with the disabled community and putting things into play how has this been impacted uh, since 2020, since COVID? How has that made your job um, more more challenging? So I, I actually think in, it has had benefits and drawbacks. Um, so I think one of the really great benefits that we have going forward is, you know, especially with like user research and everything, there, there's always been kind of a focus on, you know, bringing you to our studio, you know, you being able to sit in the user research pod with Apple setup and, let's be honest, like travel can be very, very difficult, you know, for people with certain disabilities, like even if we're willing to pay for it, like literally like the trip may not be worth that effort, right? Because of the physical demand on your body. And so we kind of had to be able to do all this work to allow for more remote connections, which is great because I feel like we just opened the store of like all of these people that we wouldn't be able to get, engage in before or get feedback from before. You know, COVID has forced us to figure out how to like find those solutions. Um, and, you know, for, for people with, uh, you know, disabilities and, and myself included, even working from home has had like some benefits to, we literally as part of the Xbox gaming and disability community, like I went, I was like talking like, Hey, how has COVID been good or bad for you? And some people were like, Hey, actually like, you know, I, I really struggled because of noise in the office and light and sound and all this stuff. And like in my office, I can come in and control everything that's happening around me. So now everything that was distracting or triggering me or causing me pain, like I'm safe now, this is great. So like that has been really awesome. But at the same time for me personally, it's been like, I, I feel like going and talking to people in person, like it gives me that recharge. Like, like I said, like working accessibility can be hard. Like you're not always told yes, you don't always get what you want and frequently you don't get what you want. And so, literally being able to connect with people like filled me back up and then like I don't quite like I get a little bit of it via like a zoom interaction but it's not the same thing and you know there's that like you mentioned like grabbing a drink afterwards like sitting by yourself alone in a room with a beer like feels vaguely alcoholic <laughs> I, mm -hmm. not not too much I'm still gonna do it with you guys but <laughs> you know it's but the the conversations are never as natural and so I feel like the biggest loss is like that random thought that someone has that you can easily interject when you can physically read people's body language and everything like you just don't really have that on you know zoom calls or discord calls because everyone's being polite and they're waiting for people to finish up their thoughts and then there's like oh no you talk no you talk mm -hmm. none of which none of which happens in person right the conversation is way more natural so I feel like you lose a bunch of those just like little snippets that turn out to be fucking genius oh wait sorry <laughs> that's and, fine and, and and be careful when you stand up too right just make sure make sure you got on shorts right because oh yeah <laughs> those things you're like sorry about that gay you know yeah here, here's the thing too uh tara that i i struggle with working from home is the snacking you know i'm like the <gasps> snacking now. you know i'm like let me get this let me get that so i gotta i gotta oh work my God. i literally have like food wrappers just like all over my desk like i love it <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting, uh, Terry, I was talking to, uh, to your colleague, Bryce uh, Johnson, uh, a little over a month ago, we were talking about how this pandemic has really opened up the door to show companies that people from dis who has disabilities can work from home and be mm -hmm. productive members of a team. Mm -hmm. So, so we definitely see like the, the good, the good thing about it, but we also see the kind of like the side effects of it as well too. And when it comes to getting like uh, user feedback, has it made it easier for you guys to get feedback now with, with a lot of people being at home and you guys working at home? What, what, what do you guys have noticed when it comes to that? 
Um, I honestly, it, it really depends per person. Um, I mean, so we obviously had some initial challenges of just like, if, if it's a product that's in, in development on, you know, the series X, for example, you can't look at that at home. We're not going to ship you a unreleased console. Um, and so like there, there are some areas where it still is a challenge. And so like, you know, you may end up having like a video recording of a dev playing through the game and then like showing you that video, which it doesn't have the same impact. And so like, that's definitely a challenge of just like, okay, well, we're, we're going to show you this and we really hope that we captured what would be important to you while trying to like, let you see this to get that consulting in. Um, so, but like other, yeah, so. No, I get you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I feel you. You know, it's kind of like uncharted waters that we're under. So, 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 where do we go from here, Steve? Where, where do we go from here when it comes to accessibility and the movement? Uh, where, where do we go from here? Well, I think uh, the fact that, uh, like, actually, kind of bring up what, what Tara was mentioning about being able to like have uh, consultants be able to work from home. Uh, I, I actually do love that, and I, and I started to kind of see a little bit of that even in myself of being able to kind of have those opportunities where essentially I get to have like my nice setup that I have like kind of created at home to be able to make it e like easier and more comfortable for me to be able to play. That to me is like that's that's the environment I'm gonna be playing the video game in anyway. So I'd rather I'd rather that and being able to do it remotely or whichever. That I think studios are now kind of starting to to realize the, the the potential of that and the fact you can be able to reach out to more now don't forget the snacking you know, get all the snacking. oh the snacking oh yeah 100 percent yeah I, like heck yeah um but uh i'd say like kind of moving forward i mean the fact that we're about to be able to kind of uh get into the new next generation of consoles um this is the first time uh that i think that we that we've had this like accessibility is is much of a topic of conversation at studios as what like what, any others kind of function or, or features that they're trying to be able to add like studios are be able to add into into their projects and like moving into next gen the fact that we're getting more powerful consoles the first time we can have really kind of start from the ground up in a way but with a good solid base of accessibility already in place um and i i think that uh that we all three nintendo sony and and xbox um i think that we've all kind of like we've all we're all kind of running in, in the same the same marathon. We're all trying to, uh, working towards a, a common goal, and the fact that we were able to have this base now, and then now we're moving into more powerful consoles, more powerful hardware, and and more options available. I think I, I'm really excited to be able to see what the next few years is going to be. Like, yeah, sure, people are going to look at the Last of Us and be like, okay, if that's the only thing they know about accessibility, great. But what's going to be awesome is going to see like three, four, five years from now when we'll be talking about accessibility in games in sort of comparing notes between what is in a game instead of basically saying, why doesn't this game have any accessibility options? Um, so I'm looking forward to, to when we can have those kind of conversations. You know, and it kind of reminds me of like in the tech world in general where um, when I worked at tech world many years, they said assistive and adaptive technologies. And now some of the features are just features that everyone can use. So it'll be nice, like you said, to, to get to that point. And, and Tara, look at some of the great things that you guys are doing over at, at Microsoft, at Xbox, Xbox accessibility controller, all these things, amazing. Mad props to you guys and the team and Bryce and everyone who put that together. Where do we go from here from a hardware standpoint, a software standpoint, or just a UX uh, standpoint? Where do we go from here? For me, what, I mean, what, what I personally want are more tools for developers to be able to make their games, the software more accessible. And I, one of the things that really stood out to me was Naughty Dog had to do so much manual work on their part to put in that accessibility. And that's insane. They are incredibly lucky to be a studio that had the time and resources to do that but a smaller studio with less people, with less clout, they literally may not have that option. And so we need to make more tools uh, really from like the, the engines and the platforms. We need to facilitate devs being able to make these accessible experiences easier because what always happens is, you know, you're going, you're building a project, you have deadlines, you have that chart of, you know, what's the impact, how many people will it reach and how long will it take to implement? And if that, how long is it going to take to implement is like 
manually recording like a bajillion lines like they had to like that that is a really easy one to be like oh well we need to cut something let's cut this one with the absurd dev time uh so like people need to be able to do things more easily and we we have some solutions um in in the xbox ecosystem but i think we we need to partner with engines we need to partner with other platforms to take our solutions and put them on their platforms um and because it comes down to it it doesn't matter how accessible the consoles are themselves if the games aren't accessible like you don't buy an xbox to watch netflix i mean that's like the number one use case for your xbox let's be real but you could do that with you know most tvs have it built in right like you yeah. don't you don't spend that money to, for a lot of the apps and experiences. You, you do it for the games. And so if the games aren't accessible, it doesn't matter how much our console is. No, I, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Tara, because it's a definitely a conversation that, that we have to have. You know, and, and I think having ones like, like yourselves, um, Steve and others, many of us who are in this fight just keep championing that cause. And that's why the conferences, um, that we still have are still going on virtually to really make sure that all the developers um, come in and, 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 and look at these conferences and find out some things that, that they can do and see this really collaborative effort. And we, we've all seen a measure of success when it comes to accessibility the last few years. And what is there to drive us to see more success out there? What, what, what's going to be our driving force out there? Steve, you go first. Uh, I think the driving force is just kind of seeing what um, other other studios and, and companies are doing and learning from that. I think uh, I think it was said best that essentially if we're able to share a lot of our information and knowledge and sort of not kind of keep it close to the uh, close to the chest, then it, then it makes it so that every good everybody can be able to play regardless of uh, of uh, whether you have a disability or not. And I think. We'll, we're gonna we're we're slowly kind of getting to that point. I think now we we've kind of gotten to the, like we're at the point now in accessibility where everybody at least majority of the studios know about accessibility, which was something that we it was a challenge for a long time. But now so now it's like okay, what do you do with that? And what do you do with that knowledge now that you know that accessibility exists? What do you do with that? And when we have like these kind of milestones like the adaptive controller, like The Last of Us they really kind of like the, the, the more information about like how that kind of came about and what can be learned from those uh, milestones is what's going to propel the industry forward. Because uh, the more we can be able to share, the more information that can be done and, and more feedback can be created and um, including the player base, uh, uh, their feedback in it as well, because we deal with like, Paul, you and I know it's like we, we deal with our disability on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah. we, we know what it's like. It's uh, so it, we can be able to offer that kind of uh, that kind of feedback. Uh, so when companies are open to that and and want to be more inclusive and able to share um, that information uh, with with more people as possible, then the more options will be available um, for disabled players to be able to jump into a hobby that that we all love. Now, I love that, Steve. Thank you for for definitely bringing that up. And see, I grew up in the hood. See, I grew up, I was born in Compton, and I. I grew up in Long Beach. So we used to have a saying like game is sold and not told, meaning that I'm not going to give you my secrets unless I get something out of it. But we see here in the gaming world and accessibility world, you know, it's all about sharing. Sharing is caring. You know, we we love to this champion, this cause. And and just to, to echo what you were saying too, uh, Steve, what should drive us too is that the fact that we want to bring more gamers in as well. Ones who've never thought about gaming because of their disability. We want to bring them in. I had a spirited discussion with another consultant one day and we were working on a project and, and he echoed like, no, it's going to be too easy. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You and I have game for a long time. We know the game. We learn to adapt. What about that little kid sitting in OT who just got injured with a spinal injury and their, their mind is just going a thousand miles a minute, not knowing how they're going to live a life now as a disabled person. Think about the joy on that kid's face when they're able to turn on the game and play it an experience. It's not about us, it's about them. And I think when we have that mindset as consultants and as advocates to realize 
It's not about us. It's about them, the newer gamers, who we want to bring into this fold to experience just the social aspect of gaming. That could be a powerful driving driving force too. And, and Tara, you know, from a professional standpoint, what can we do to continue to drive? Love to hear your thoughts on it. I mean, honestly, I think one of the, th the biggest things in gamers with disabilities favor is uh, game devs are getting old. We are getting old and our bodies are failing us. And the same, right? The, the amount of my coworkers that I see, they're like, oh yeah, but I, I can only play this game for like an hour and then my hand hurts or like, oh yeah, tell, tell me, tell me more about that. Uh, like there, I think there's a lot of game devs who are realizing that, you know, they were building for other people and they've in, they have aged into other people now. Um, so I think like, because game dev is, you know, like compared to a lot of industries that like, we're still young and we're snappy and like, we're doing things our own way. And like literally years of overtime and binge streaking are causing our bodies to slowly disintegrate that people are realizing like oh man the stuff I didn't think important like I need that now like now now that uh you know especially like a lot of like our old school like idols are like married with children and don't have times to do things like oh you're you're no longer like a like a 22 year old like genius who cannot sleep for three days to build games um so i think number one that that is great in pushing us forward because like we have matured as an industry and so we know we we have things that we need to build but i think the other biggest thing that we can do and the, really the thing that has the most impact is and as a game designer, as a game, not even just a designer, as a game developer, you want everyone to play your game. You don't build a game thinking, well, I only want it for this group of people. No, the goal is you want as many people to play it as possible. And so the reality of being shown that you as a game developer made a decision that unintentionally meant someone couldn't play, it has a deep emotional effect. Like I have literally seen game devs cry after a meeting where someone said they couldn't play because of X, Y, Z, and then the person walked out and then the dev being like, I was the one who did that. I thought it was the best choice and realizing the impact of the actions. And it's not that they did it on purpose. It's not like they sat there that day and was like, I want this particular disabled gamer not to enjoy my product. No, they just didn't think about it. And so the more that we can get people connected, the more we can make disabilities vis visible in gaming, and the more we can allow gamers, you know, to tell their stories in front of devs, the bigger impact it'll have. Because like I said, game devs want to build their products for everyone. They just don't always have a wide enough view of who everyone is. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tara. Really, really candid answer. And, and I'm sure many developers out there uh, really echo, echo that sentiment. Thank you so much for sharing that. And and yes, Tara, the struggle is real. As we get older, we need to take those naps, don't we? That's mm. right. See, Steve, see, Steve don't know nothing about that. He's still a young whippersnapper. You know, well, hold on, hold on. I enjoy a nap just as much as the next person. I mean, I hell, I'm probably gonna go have a nap right after this. Like, there you go, there you go. Tell me, well, you gotta have a shot first, then a nap. Yes, and, and there then, you go. Then yeah. everything is fine. And and it just really shows that where we're at in the stream of time when it comes to accessibility. Um, appreciate everyone's insight and, and all your all your experience and your, and your candor. And I'm sure everyone out there listening and, and checking out this, uh, this virtual talk, this virtual workshop, really got a lot out of it. And before I let you go, anything else out there, uh, Tara, you want to uh, say to those who are listening, who are watching, who are in industry, or maybe just disabled, disabled community in general, anything like you, you'd like to close with? I mean, really, my, my biggest thing is if we had a more diverse workplace in gaming, we would have less of these issues. Um, and I, I'm not just talking about, you know, gamers with disability. I'm talking about all sorts of underrepresented groups, you know, LGBTQIA, Latinx, uh, Blacks in gaming, women in gaming, uh, you know, the in game and people with disabilities. If we had better representation in dev teams, there would be someone on the team to catch it, you know, before you get too far down the pipeline, because it's amazing to have consultants who will help you. But we all know that if you bring in consultants too late, even if they give you the best advice, you won't have time to act on it. So if you have a diverse dev team, you'll hear about that stuff even earlier 
meaning that you can make steps. So by the time you're, you're down the line, when you are bringing in consultants, like you've already set your consultants up for success, right? Like, you know, you did a pre-read, you know, rather than just learning about everything for the first time. Um, and the more diverse views and ideas you have in the dev team, the better ideas and products you're going to make. So literally go out there. There are people with disabilities who want to work in game dev who are extremely talented. Literally hire them. Just hire them. That's just hire them. Thank you. I, I love that, Tara. And Tara, that, that reminds me, like, right after um, The Last of Us Part Two came out, and then when people saw that I was one of the consultants on there, they were like, you know, you're the first kind of Black accessibility consultant that I that I seen and I was like, really? And then I looked around and I was like, it ain't that many of us. So so you're right, you're right. That that, that diversity and representation that definitely matters. And Steve, I'm sure you probably felt the same way when when once we're blind was like, wait a minute, a blind accessibility consultant, you know? So so yeah, so we definitely see that. So Steve, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what's your closing words and thoughts out there to, uh, for one's other? Uh, I mean, I'm totally gonna echo uh, both of you in, in that essentially we've, this year in 2020, um, one of the, out of all like the, the, the stuff we've kind of had to uh, go through as a society uh, this year has been, has been rough. But one of the things that I'm, the, the silver lining I'm kind of taking out of it is that we are um, being exposed to more diverse cultures than we ever really had before. Um, I think the, that's kind of the beauty and sort of the negativity of, of, of social media is that we get to kind of see that in its raw, uh, purest form. And I'll even say myself, like I, I was never like fully expo uh, exposed to, uh, uh, like, uh, POC or, um, or, or, or women in gaming or LGBTQ in, uh, in gaming as much as I have this year. And I really kind of took the time to kind of like want to be able to learn more about, uh, about those cultures and, and, and see, and, and try to be able to see from the, like from their perspective and really kind of be as open-minded as possible. So I think, and you're both right, essentially, uh, in order to be able to kind of, ch uh, to adopt those cultures, you kind of have to change the culture in internally. Um, it's, uh, gaming is not just straight, like white dudes, uh, playing video games. It's, it's more than that. They're, they're, all the colors and uh, of the rainbow and all of the, uh, all the different, uh, people like people just in, in, in general, um, we're all very diverse and we're all very unique. And when you have those kind of unique and diverse voices, and not even just like in the disability, but just in general, like it kind of makes your product or what you're working on better. Um, and yes, we can make mistakes along the way and there definitely will be mistakes made along the way, even with the best intentions in mind. But the, the best the advice I can give for that is if when those mistakes happen is to learn from it, figure out what, like what you can be able to do to, to, uh, to fix that in the future and then make those changes. And so we're going to, I think we're going to see that now. Um, it, it, I think it's definitely this year is, is a touchstone for that, uh, not just accessibility, but in general. And I'm looking forward to, to that day when, when, uh, when we can be able to uh, say that Paul, that, that you're not the only POC accessibility consultant, uh, in, in the industry. We're going to see a lot more of that. And, uh, and, and we're like, it's, it's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to, to that moment. Now, my, I don't mind my bank account, don't mind, but I, but I, but, I mean, I hear you, but, but, I hear you. <laughs> but I love, I love, I love sharing, sharing, uh, sharing the pie with everyone else out there to get everybody else's view, view as well. And and Tara Velker, Steve Saylor, great spending some time with you and and chatting it up about something that that we all are passionate about, accessibility in 2020 and beyond. And thank you guys so much. And Tara, I love the hair, you're Thanks. amazing. Steve, always good to see you, my friend. And uh, Everyone stay well. Take care.